Arcane is a masterpiece, and it might just be the best thing I've seen all year. I do not say this lightly, but from the presentation, the writing, the characters, I think this is it, folks. This is that good shit, and it almost justifies League of Legends' existence. Almost. Now, this video will have a ton of spoilers. Before I get into that, let me just spend a few minutes trying to explain why I love this show and why it's up there with the Spider-Verse for me when it comes to animation. I'm not a League of Legends fanboy, I never got into it. So trust me when I say that anyone can watch this show, so you absolutely should. First, we need to go over some basic essentials, like how the gleaming city of Piltover wouldn't be possible without Demo Creator. Yes, right into it. This product is for everyone that wants to start a blog, gaming channel, or just needs an all-in-one software for all your video making needs. Whether it's editing videos or recording them, Demo Creator has got you covered. Because if you ever have tried to record anything on your screen, then you should know all your built-in options are terrible. With next to no room for error, but with Demo, Finally, you can take control of your screen. Stop and start anytime you want, highlight your mouse or draw, because why not? Then when you're all done, it immediately gets uploaded to Demo's video editor, filled to the brim with all sorts of fun effects to play around with, from stickers to facial effects. This whole thing is a treat to dig into. By far, my favorite part of Demo is its transitions. As well, it's got plenty of flashy moves for the creatives out there. It also includes some simple but essential speed blurs that I had to make by hand for my own videos. For you, they're just custom built into the system and waiting for you to slap them on. Demo has captions, filters, a special effects store. It's pretty much all the goodies you can ask for. If you want a modern recording and editing software, this is the place to start. Plus with an easy to use export system that lets you control the format and destination of your videos, you can be on your way to becoming a YouTube star in seconds. So go ahead, give it a try. We got brand new Black Friday deals going right now. So hurry up, click the link down in the description and go get your own demo creator. Now, Netflix's Arcane was a show I didn't have any opinion on till I watched it. Never played the game. Was kind of a bit salty at the fact that this game cost me all my friends in high school. So I had to go make new ones. But I did learn a little bit about the lore just from hanging out with them. So when I saw the trailer, I still didn't care because it looked like the story was going to be about the Harley Quinn clone. Love Harley Quinn, hate her imitators. I even put off watching this show for a few days till a nice gray Wednesday where I just set my phone down to charge, clicked Arcane, kind of just out of obligation. Two hours later, I finished the first three episodes, and as those ending credits rolled, I was left with literal chills. And I realized I hadn't touched my phone once. Yeah, it was that good. Arcane is a story of the sisters Vi and Jinx, and the personal tragedies that forge them into who they are, as civil unrest, politics, and good intentions all spin out of control, tearing the girls and the very city apart. While this is technically an origin story, this show is first and foremost a tragedy. I went into this show roughly knowing how it would end, but it had me crying wishing that I didn't. Unlike a lot of other origin stories that are so overly concerned with setting up stuff and overall plot points, Arcane understands that it needs you to care first and foremost about the characters. This isn't Solo, where everyone begins and ends the story exactly the same, but with their iconic swag. Every character is different by the end of the story, and it feels natural. I think one of the worst things you can do in a prequel is trying to force a character into becoming their technical, canonical selves when there isn't enough evidence to support a change like that. I think the worst thing the Star Wars prequels ever did was building up Anakin as this semi-flawed, yeah, he went on massacre one time, but ultimately, he was a heroic and good person 99% of the time. That is how he was portrayed, and that's how the movies got us to care about him. So for his turn to the dark side to immediately begin with him <laughs> massacring children, I had to say, hold up. Because they had three movies to build up a turn like this, it's so jarring in how abrupt its main character turns evil that it leaves Anakin feeling more like a prop 
than a person with his own internal logic or motivation. The characters were serving the needs of the plot and not the other way around. And I know this is a problem with a lot of prequels. They are so eager to make things how you remember them that they kind of disregard the characters that they have. So that's why I am so happy with Arcane that not a single character feels like they're acting because the plot needs them to. They feel like real people doing their best in a bad situation, and that doesn't always lead to a good outcome. No one feels like just a trope. They feel real, sucking you deeper and deeper into the story as you wish for the best outcome for everyone. You want almost everyone to be happy, only to watch it all crumble. It's compelling. From a young scientist trying to change the world for the better, to the father who's stuck between saving his city or protecting his kids. You may not like all the people in here, but you understand why they do the things that they do. With the storytelling just continually hooking you, and at no point do you want to let go. This show was released in three acts. Three episodes each, 40 minutes apiece and all builds to a climax that, while abrupt to some people, is just perfect. It is gut-wrenching, and it just left me jonesing for that second season that's already been announced. And it fucking deserves that season. The story is great, the characters compelling, and the animation is... Calling it good would be a disservice. Like, this feels like the next stage of 3D animation, because for years, there's been this divide between people who prefer 2D and those who like 3D. You get this the worst in anime circles, but the problem with those 3D animes would be that they would just be used to replicate what they would normally do in 2D, with the results being awful, because it's not playing to the strengths of the medium or otherwise just mashing the two together. Arcane is that next level shit. It's the Spider-Verse where the characters are 3D, but also incorporates these beautiful 2D backgrounds and effects that are stylized, but when you're watching it, feel seamless. Certain characters like Heimendinger, I don't know what they're doing, but rather than making a big goofy CGI mustache, they create a layer that was able to bend with the animation, capturing that furry look without actually having to make him furry. It's just stunning, and every time I watch it, I find more and more to love. Facial animation is something not a lot of people think about when they're watching, but man, do you feel the difference. All the feeling and character being conveyed in subtle touches like this scene with Jinx, where we watch her go from a scared girl to the devious criminal mastermind who can barely contain her own laughter. The budget for this show was allegedly millions higher than the average, and you can feel that with just how the characters move and look. Arcane really is that good. And honestly, I can't recommend this show enough. The action is intense but easy to follow, the atmosphere is unmatched, they use a lot of great music in the show, not all of it is to my taste, but it nails what they're going for. With the ending to episode 3, Goodbye, probably being my favorite. If you have a pulse, go check out the first three episodes and see if it's for you. You really don't need to play League to enjoy this. Alright, that's enough, let's go into spoilers. If you don't want to be spoiled, now's your chance to jump off. Like, share, and sub, come back, and finish the rest later. I'll still be here when you get back, I promise. And what do I have? You're hot, Cupcake. So what'll it be, man or woman? Um... Alright, let's talk spoilers. In no discernible order. And this will be mostly me gushing about the characters in full fanboy mode. Plus my, like, three critiques. I think the strongest part of the show is its first act. It's all amazing, but the first act is legitimately, like, this should be used to teach classes. We watch these kids succeed and fail, and how it's not always a question of ability, but simply how sometimes doing your best fucks over everyone else in your life. It does the same thing that the Rise of the Planet of the Apes did, giving up on overly complicated characters and twists, instead creating characters who you understand within five seconds, and then exploring why they're like that and the effect that they have on one another. In Rise, you know that the ape with the scars is gonna be the villain, but you love watching the frustration slowly build up inside before he snaps and does a thing that you knew he was going to do. It's not surprising, but thanks to the great execution, it is so satisfying. The storytelling, the characters, are the thing that sucked me into this show. As I understood all of them almost immediately, you can see the traits that will make them a success, but also how those traits can lead them astray. Character drives the plot of the story, and I honestly wouldn't have it any other way. This isn't a world of black and white. Good people can do bad things, while bad people can do somewhat decent ones. No one feels fully locked into a trope, 
and they have their own personal motivations for why they do the things that they do. The Sheriff, Marcus, is a great example of that. Starting out as his arrogant glory hound who never knows when to shut up, when his deal with Silco gets his partner killed, he's overcome with regret and saves Vi's life. This comes at the cost of leaving powder to be taken by Silco, causing the child to believe that she was abandoned. Good intentions, but with awful consequences. And when Marcus comes back, he's now the chief of police and still working with Silco, not because he likes him or that he wants the money. He does it because he's learned the cost of not playing ball with criminals. He hated how the old sheriff worked with Vander, but now he sees she was right, and that while it's against his morals, it's the price he's willing to pay to keep the peace. The only difference? Selko is a monster, while Vander wasn't. We get why Marcus is doing this, and how he isn't just some crooked cop. He has his own internal logic, and we see that in every character. Vi resents Piltover for how it treats her and her friends, but because she can't do anything, she's constantly pissed off and makes hasty decisions when she's angry. Vi nearly rescues Vander, but then Jinx thought they needed help and ended up getting them all killed. And we know that she shouldn't have hit Powder, but she just experiences that loss, so you can't fully blame her, you understand why she did it. We even see her try and walk away to cool off, but that accidentally leaves her sister at the mercy of Silco. And Jinx's journey in this early part of the story is honestly perfect. He's as the baby of the bunch, she is so desperate to prove herself, but also suffers from not just being smaller than everyone else, but the expectations she puts on herself and from others to be like Vi. She wants to be strong, but the standards that the group judges her by cause her to always come up short. Later, when we see Jinx doing this insane shit, we can tell that she's overcompensating. When she raids Jace's lab for crystals, she does to prove her worth to Silco that she is strong and to not abandon her. And that mentality really starts early on with Powder, not when Vi calls her a Jinx or Silco raising her. Jinx came up believing that she was lacking, and that only got worse as the story went on. And what makes this so heartbreaking is how we can tell she is talented. Her bombs don't work now, but later on even Victor gives her props. When she was at the arcade, she was the best shot in the group. But tech and gunsling weren't skills that the group valued, so Powder doesn't value them, ruining her already bad self-esteem. And to top it all off is how the story really shows that Vander, their surrogate father, doesn't really build up Powder as much as he probably should. He's too busy trying to manage Vi, who is independent and more likely to cause trouble. But those life lessons he's giving Vi don't really trickle down to Powder, leaving her fragile to trauma and being raised by a psychopath. Which, need to get this out of the way? If I see one more, Silco was a great dad post. I think I'll just blow myself up. Yes, Silco is a great character. Initially, he's just a cold, menacing villain who's obsessed with gaining power and making the underground its own country. But thanks to the performance of Kid Flash from Young Justice and his relationship to Jinx, he comes out having a lot more nuance. Yes, he is a murderous kingpin who could easily kill children, but he's still capable of empathizing with other people, like Jinx, as he knows what it feels like to be abandoned and hurt by family. His willingness to care and protect Jinx from the consequences of her own actions show off a paternal part of his nature I didn't expect to see. He genuinely wants to help Jinx overcome her past and visions by giving her a toxic river baptism, like he did. When Jinx was dying, the man threw everything out the window so that he could save her. Jinx ended up becoming his top priority, which made him a lot more interesting of a character than the menacing one-dimensional villain Act 1 made him out to be. But, and this is the big but, Silco is a terrible father. Yes, even after getting killed by his daughter, he didn't blame her and told her she was perfect. But that's pretty much not blaming your child for starting a fire after you gave them matches and covered the house in gasoline. Powder was a traumatized youth who never really got over what happened at the factory, accidentally killing her family and seemingly getting abandoned by her sister. Silco's idea of helping was to give the girl a machine gun and infinite ammo to attack his enemies. He taught her to use violence as an outlet for all of her issues, even going so far as to control her perception of her old family, constantly telling her how Vander tried to kill him, that he wasn't the person that she knew. Silco was a man who was able to overcome his own trauma by virtue of being way too petty to die, believing that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He's a terrible person, but he is functional. But him believing Powder just needed the same treatment kept pushing her to be more and more reckless, plus his blanket covering for her when she did fuck up. Jinx never fully considers the consequences of her actions, because as far as she's concerned, as long as she kept Silco happy, there were none. She's a nutcase who needs help. 
and telling her that she's perfect is an amazing way to go out. It validates all of Jinx's actions and behaviors. So when I hear people say, Silco was a great dad, I see what they mean in theory, but when you look at the person Jinx turned out to be, that shit is on him more than anything else. Though I do love him as a character and was so happy that he wasn't grooming her. It's Jinx, all of us, the sons and daughters of Zon, deserve more than their runoff. That scene nearly gave me a heart attack. Like all the super touchy feely scenes between them, I just about died. Oh, thank God. Great way to show off how slightly off their relationship is, like it's a perversion of the father-daughter bond we saw between Vi and Vander. All this contributes, though, to building a character that I both hated and loved. Honestly, what's so shocking is that he isn't even the best character in the show. Everyone is so well-written. Like Vander, who I absolutely loved, is just the perfect hybrid of doomed mentor and a man with a tortured past. He's pretty much the best outcome you can hope for with whatever Kratos is doing in Dad of War. Vander was once a revolution with Silka, who wanted to create a nation independent of Piltover. Piltover being this great gleaming city of progress that can only exist because it's built on the exploitation of the inhabitants of the Undercity. So yeah, capitalism. Vayner's dream for independence burns to the ground once he realizes the price needed to make that happen, and his inability to see them winning against Piltover's superior military. We first see him killing a man surrounded by dead bodies of his friends and two children staring at their dead parents. This causes him to throw away his weapons and decide that independence wasn't worth it, and he'd rather save their lives than risk giving them better ones. So when we next meet him, he's the de facto leader of the Undercity, keeping his people safe and standing up for the little guys. Vander is so firmly against fighting that he's willing to work with the people who oppress him if it means keeping his people safe and stopping any more conflicts from happening. The man loves his kids, and the fact that he toe to toe with a shimmered out thug shows off what a badass he is. And in the end, when he's given the choice between saving Vi and revenge on Silco, he picked Vi, holding true to that lesson that he learned on the bridge, not hurting what he hates, but saving what he loves. A great death to a great character, and f I don't want him to come back in season two. Yeah, for those who don't know, there's a character in League called Warwick. He's a cyborg werewolf with a connection to Vi and Jinx. Combine that with his nickname being the Hound of the Underground, it's pretty much guaranteed that Vayner is going to come back as Warwick, and I really don't want that. The death was painful and traumatic for everyone involved, and I kind of feel like just bringing him back would feel cheap that like it could be good, but I see it just taking away more than whatever drama that can be gained from digging up his dead corpse. Honestly, I think he just worked as a Mundo stand-in. This show though, wouldn't have worked if they cramped in every champion that is technically connected to these cities. Like less is more and having to explain all these characters really wouldn't have done it any favors. Like Singed being here only works because he is kept in the background and when he's relevant. That's not the kind of restraint I'm used to seeing media these days. So I would honestly be happy if they just didn't increase the cast too much in season two, like two or three new characters maybe, but everyone else can stay the same. Another Another high point of the show was its ability to balance the tale of two cities angle. Zon and Piltover are polar opposites that only exist because of each other. Piltover is great because it can exploit Zon, Zon is filled with dangerous criminals and drug addicts because the absence of order made people desperate and willing to do anything to protect themselves. Each city has a completely different design and vibe to it, both before and after the time skip. Before Hextech, Piltover was still a rich city, but after, it got richer, buildings got taller, all this gleaming arcane tech started appearing everywhere, and you can just feel how much better it is to be in this city. In contrast to Zaun, things got worse. Under Vander, things were bad, but the underground still felt solid. You could get that real sense of community beneath it all. With Silco though in charge and the Shimmer, the city was more energized, more high-tech advancements and neon lighting. But you could feel the city running itself ragged, with the camps of drug addicts showing off how unhealthy this city really is. The push and pull between both city's leaders feels like it's a real-world conflict, I it's complicated and the anticipation of violence makes violence inevitable. But like always, it's always about people trying to do what they think is best. In Piltover, we follow Jace, Victor, and Mel as they struggle with the discovery of Hextech and how to best utilize it. And Mel was honestly the standout to me. She comes off as this ambitious, conniving politician who you totally expect to be the one to take things too far, while our good 
boy science guys get to keep their hands clean. Instead, Mel turned out to be one of the more interesting characters in the show. A diplomat in all things, who aspires to wealth and power, but still cares for those she's close to. We get to see that she truly wants what's best for the city. Rather than being a straight good guy, she gets to act as both an inspiration and a corrupting influence on Jace, pushing him to loosen his morals to get things done, and pushing him to take on more and more power, which is fine at the start. Her telling him to continue with his Hextech research is what allows them to advance the city in the first place. But later on, when she's trying to guide him on how to be in the council, actually causes trouble, as we see him try and tighten his grip on the city, nearly becoming a dictator, culminating with him accidentally murdering a child. Mel wasn't the evil advisor who pushed him into this. She just wanted to help him get from A to B, only for him to take that lesson and jump all the way to X. Then her mom shows up to stir up shit and bang twinks. And when we're not watching this descent into corruption, we're watching Victor going to extreme lengths to secure his legacy. My initial read on Victor was that he was going to be the resentful partner to Jace, who would snap as he realized Jace was getting all the credit and attention. And that's so played out. Instead, we watched a dying man struggle with his own mortality, with his transition into being a cyborg, being born out of a genuine desire to help people, only for him to fall to the temptation of fixing himself all at once, causing him to kill his assistant, and nearly taking his own life before Jace returns the favor from all those years ago. And that's just so perfect. Victor is so divorced from your typical petty overreaction that you see in so many science villains. They're upstanding members of society one second, something goes wrong, and they're wearing tights and screaming obscenities for the rest of their lives. Instead, Victor stays true to his character, a scientist whose good intentions are corrupted by his own desperation. And you think that keeping characters consistent would be a no-brainer, but it's shocking how little it's done. I also love how Victor and Jace come into conflict with Heimertinger. Heimertinger is great. He's a kooky grandpa scientist, who's basically what if Gandalf was a hobbit. And I like him because he reveals the flaws of the wise old mentor character. In Lord of the Rings, if you disagree with Gandalf, you're either wrong or a villain. Heimerdinger is often right, but he has his blind spots. Magic being the big one, he lived through some war that was caused by magic and sees how dangerous it could be. There's potential there, sure, but he's seen it go wrong and doesn't think it's worth risking unleashing those horrors again. It makes him turn down Jace's research, but he was willing to admit that he was wrong, till he sees how close they are to releasing chaos, forcing him to put his foot down, even if it means dooming Victor to death revealing the pitfalls of being a near immortal advising mortal humans and how to live their lives. The dude probably is going to keep living for centuries, and thinks of science in a much longer time span than the humans he works with. They may even be a little bit resentful of how he talks about how great it will be, or the mark they'll leave behind, when he gets to keep on living. It causes him to come off as patronizing at worst, or out of touch at best, especially when it comes to the suffering in Zaun. In the story, he's seen as the wise mentor, but we also see him to be fallible, and the fact that even the smartest of us can be wrong opens the floodgates to keep disagreeing with him, even when he's definitely right. So when Jay snaps and forces him off the council, you feel that, but you also understand it. And I can't can't wait to see him help Echo build his time machine BS. This show thrives on its characters and their interactions. We understand who they are, but we also have the fun of seeing how they affect each other. Put Vi and Caitlyn together, and you get a buddy cop with sexual tension, balancing each other out and making for an effective team. Also, shipping video? Probably. Yes, definitely. You put Vi and Jace together, and their recklessness spurs them to act, but to not consider the consequences of those actions. Meanwhile, with Victor and Jace? I just need to say this. My actual gut reaction to the both of them was the following. Oh, aren't you a handsome man? Oh, he's the guy that f and as far as actual critiques for this show, everything comes down to small adjustments. Little tweaks they could have made to certain scenes, nothing too major. Except this one. Echo doesn't feel like he should be in this season. And I say that as someone who liked him. He was good friends with Vi and Jinx as kids. But he always felt like just the other guy. Even when he comes back in the present, he kinda just stands around and gives you generic you can't save her lines. He has one fantastic scene on the bridge and helped teach Heimendinger a moral. But out of all the characters in the opening, he's the only one who feels extremely underutilized. Echo feels like he's just here so they don't have to introduce him in season two. The action scene with the watch was phenomenal, it hints at his future time travel abilities. In season one though, don't expect too much from him, as he does feel like his time gets cut short. And another small gripe is that the music videos. They're great, they're good, the one where they're actually showing the band playing felt really out of place. Also, this shot had me in tears. It looks like he's singing the song, and I just found that to be hilarious. 
Arcane. That's about it. Like, that is all my complaints for Arcane. I honestly think that this is a masterpiece, and I'm so excited that we're actually getting another season. The direction for this show is phenomenal. The visuals can pull off stylized badassery or somber beauty. And it may be my personal taste changing, but I found that right now, I really enjoy tragic endings more than the typical happy ones. Both have their place, but to me, a tragedy just sticks with you so much longer. It gnaws at you. Rewatching the show reminds you of all the dozens of small decisions that slowly tip the scales to this outcome. From a simple hug between Vi and Kate to Silco grabbing the gun, Jinx nuking the council as they are about to give Zahn everything it wants. If just one thing had gone differently, this outcome could have been prevented. And that's just the beauty of it. Vi could have had a chance to help Jinx deal with her grief, or Marcus could have revealed Silco's treachery. But no, this was the ending. One horrific act of violence made beautiful by the direction and painful by the characters. We're left wondering what could have been, and nothing this year has come close to the magic of this final scene. Arcane was a masterpiece. It's as simple as that.